Now you gotta get. Uh, I did yesterday. I did the smoked brisket grilled cheese with the mango berry salad. Oh, yeah. Where is that place? Cafe Zupas. That you can. Is that? Um, there's one at Ridgedale Mall. Is it? But you go there and you can do a combo. You can do half sandwich and half salad, and you get a mango. Like mine is the mango berry salad. So you got mango, strawberries Chicken with a mango salad. yogurt dressing. The best part is for chocolate uh, covered strawberry. Maybe, like, oh, what? oh my you god! Get I love yeah, you get a bun, a chocolate covered strawberry, your half salad, and your sandwich. It's like thirteen bucks, fourteen bucks. Oh. <laughs> I joined. I had to join the club yesterday because I think they were like, "Get a free meal on your tenth," and I'm like, "I should have two free meals right now." All right, everybody. Dude. Again, good afternoon. <laughs> it is four past the hour. I love that the uh, beginning of this recording was going to feature Josh in a dark silhouette talking about mango berry salad. I'm sure our editing team will go to work on. Uh, on. Uh, it's all right, Josh. If you we haven't had food. it, you need it, Colin. Yeah, we need your food recommendations for oh, sure. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, can everybody see my screen in this big, pretty slideshow here? Not a yes. Thank you, Gabby. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. I really think that if you are here, you're going to be um, the most knowledgeable on what kind of changes are happening before our very eyes with conventional loans. Some of you were on our March 1st training, which discussed this at length. Um, if you weren't, that's okay. We're gonna dive even deeper into it today. So there are some changes that are happening with how conventional loans are priced. And I think that considering conventional is the most popular mortgage product out there and has been for quite some time, this is gonna affect a ton of buyers in 2023 and perhaps beyond. If you haven't been on this Wednesday training before, welcome. Um, this is interactive. So uh, if you want to jump in and interject, ask questions, opine, whatever you want to do, that's what this is all about. There's nothing more boring than me just talking to a screen for 40 minutes. So with that said, let's get, uh, let's get started with this. So conventional is big time changing the rate that buyers get through loan level price adjustments. First of all, let's start there. What is an LLPA? Uh, a loan level price adjustment is basically a fee or a discount that gets applied to mortgage loans, regardless of the lender, by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, depending on a couple of risk factors. There are some obvious ones, the credit score, the loan to value ratio, the type of property being financed, for example, condos have a risk adjustment that goes all the way back to the housing crash. We still are considering condos more risky. And then also the duration of the loan. Right? You're going to get a break if you do a 15-year versus a 30-year in rate and then loan level price adjustment. Now, for a long time, and even still, borrowers with lower credit scores or higher loan to values, which would mean less down payment, would be charged higher loan level price adjustments to offset that risk. If you're a 640 credit score with 3% down, you're going to pay the most. If you're an 800 credit score with 40% down, you're going to pay the least. And that structure is still in effect. It's just that the lines are blurring between those two. Now, loan level price adjustments can be expressed as a percentage of the loan amount or as a flat fee, and they're often factored into the interest rate. Think about this as a function of points. Whenever we talk about points, we are talking about one point equals 1% of the loan amount, right? So for example, this bottom part, a 75% risk adjustment on a $400,000 loan is three grand, okay? Or if you factor that into the loan amount, it's about three eighths of a point in rate. So for example, I'm quoting a rate to Josh. He's my mortgage borrower. I'm saying, all right, here's the deal, Josh. You can get a 6.5% 30-year fixed, but you're going to have to pay three quarters of a point up front, which is three grand. Or you can take a higher interest rate, about three-eighths of a point higher, 6.875, and you don't have to pay that $3,000 up front. Okay? These loan level price adjustments 
are reflective of points. Does everybody understand that? If you look at that bottom example, read that a couple times, that's gonna be key for you understanding exactly how much in dollars and cents things are changing. Colin, Colin, does it make more sense then for the to pay it up front? Is it quote unquote cheaper or less over the life of the loan? Or what would you recommend they do? Number one, most important question: How long are you going to keep the loan? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and it used to be how long are you going to live in the house? Now it's how long are you going to keep <laughs> the loan? Right. Yeah, because if sense. you're going to live there for 12 months and then you're going to refinance, probably not real smart to pay $3,000 up front. You're only going to get that interest savings for 12 months. Right. But good question. And this is why we're starting to see, by the way, closing costs. Anybody realize it's like, what the hell? Like, you know, it used to be 3% of the purchase price, you'd be covered and then some, right? And now it just seems like closing costs, it's like with inflation, they're going up and up and up and up. It's because these loan level price adjustments have started to get baked into the rate. And everybody's so rate sensitive that you're starting to see clients getting quoted a full percentage point. Or if you go to Rocket or some of these other lenders, two percentage points in points up front. Well, there's your 3%, two of your 3% of your seller pays right there. So think about these loan level price adjustments as points, all right? So when you see 0.75%, okay, that's three quarters of the loan amount. My loan amount is three grand, that's 2,200 bucks. So three quarters of 1% of the loan amount in cash up front. That's gonna be the way to think about this. Oh my gosh, why are we only talking about this on Fox News and CNBC and everything now? Well, it's because it takes some time for this stuff to work its way through the news cycle. And so these loan level price adjustments were announced on January 19th, and they were to take effect on May 1st. Now, it takes these lenders a while to deliver these loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? So think about that. If you're starting to do a loan, you have a closing in February, you have a closing in March. Well, that loan's probably not going to go to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac for another 60 days, right? So we got to get these loan level price adjustments in so that we're not on the hook to, for them as a lender. So, you know, you have borrowers that call me up and say, gosh, I got to buy before May 1st, because otherwise I'm going to have these crazy loan level price adjustments that they were talking about. Guess what? They're already in all lenders price sheets and have been for some time since February, or March. Okay. Now, initially, when this was rolled out on January 19th, there was going to be another quarter point loan level price adjustment, quarter point on a $300,000 loan, 750 bucks, if you had a debt to income ratio over 40%. But that went away in March after some lender backlash. Okay, so if there's any good news to come out of this, it's that the DTI does not matter. You can have a debt to income ratio of 5%, 15%, 50%. It does not affect your interest rate on conventional loans, all right? A lot of borrowers will say, I've got a really low DTI. And I said, that's great, but it's ir it's totally irrelevant when it comes to what kind of interest rate you get. Let's look at this bad boy. This is great reading if you're having insomnia. So along the top here, you will see loan to value. All right, 95% means 5% down, then you got 10% down, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and then 40 plus. And then along the left side here, the Y axis is gonna be your credit score. A reminder that on FHA loans, you'd have a 640 credit score, a 740 credit score, an 840 credit score. It really doesn't affect your rate and it definitely does not affect your PMI. All right, so with FHA, it's a blanket rate that you get regardless of what your credit score is. With conventional, it's much more granular. It works in 20 point increments with your credit score, right? So if you get above 659, you get vaulted into a new category. And then if you get to 680, you're in a new category, 700, 720, 740, 760, 780 plus. By the way, this 780 plus category is new. It used to be just 760 plus, okay? So 
if you think about, you know, how much am I actually paying for this loan level price adjustment? Find your credit score on the X axis and find your loan to value on the Y axis. Or in plain English, I've got a 740 credit score and I've got 15% um, down. All right, you're gonna pay three quarters of a point in this loan level price adjustment, right? Now notice, and this is where it gets wonky, you know, put 15% down, but don't you dare put 20% down because that's actually gonna cost you a little bit more, right? Why is it that we're okay with 15% down, but we're jumping into this category of if you actually put 15 to 20% down, it's gonna cost you a little bit more. And if you're looking for me to answer that question, I don't have a good answer for that. But 15% down borrowers get hit the hardest. The big thing to take away from this is that it's not like these headlines have you believing, where if you have worse credit, you're gonna actually pay less. So don't go out there and start rolling up 30, 60, 90 day lates on credit cards and <laughs> installment loans trying to game the system because you're still going to pay more, okay? If you look at how these changed from the previous loan level price adjustments, you will see where things got better and where things got worse. Green is good, which means that the loan level price adjustments went down. Red is bad. Red is where they went up. So if you look at everything that's in this 95% plus down category, it's all green on the right-hand side. That is good. That's a takeaway from this that, hey, it got cheaper for you to buy a home with a smaller down payment, regardless of your credit score. Right? It doesn't matter what credit category you fall in. If you have 5% down or less, these changes helped you it made it more affordable for you. The red is what some people would say is subsidizing this. Look at these two here, these three quarters of a point. So if you have 15 plus percent down and you have a 720 to 759 credit score, you are paying three quarters of a point in rate or upfront to have this you know, loan level price adjustment applied to you, right? Um, you see where else people got hit hard. You have somebody that says, gosh, I've got a 730 credit score, Colin, and I've got 20% down. That should be a pretty risk-free loan. Well, not according to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, right? your loan actually became half a point more expensive than it was before these changes were announced. The skinny of what's changing. The effective penalty for having a credit score under 680 is smaller than it was, right? Look at this bottom line here. Everything that's 660 to 679 is all green. So it actually got cheaper for you if you have a 670 credit score to utilize a low down payment conventional loan, okay? Now it still costs more to have a lower score, but not as much more. What's the difference, for example, for a 5% down buyer with a 670 credit score versus a 5% down buyer with a 730 credit score. Only half a point in rate, not a huge difference, okay? So for those borrowers that typically were going FHA, they might wanna look at conventional and then borrowers that were typically going FHA might want to, I'm sorry, uh, going conventional might want to look at FHA. And we're going to cover that in a moment. Um, borrowers with higher credit scores will generally be paying a little bit more than they were under the previous structure. There's no way around that, right? 
And we've seen the politicization of this in terms of like, are we subsidizing lower risk borrowers at the cost of higher risk borrowers? In a way, yes. There's not a way around that statement. There's a new benefit to having a 780 credit score, right? Previously, this was 670 plus. So when people come to me and brag and say, I've got an 820 credit score, I used to say awesome because I knew that doesn't mean anything because you're 760 or above. Now you've got a couple tiers above that, right? It's not going to give you much of a benefit, but you are starting to see that breakout above 760. Big increases for cash out refinances. So these apply to refinances as well. And um, we're going to get into what that probably means in reading the tea leaves for the future of rates in a moment. The why of this. There's been a concerted effort to increase home affordability. And this administration particularly has been pushing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to decrease the pain for first time buyers. Sandra Thompson, who leads Fannie Mae and Fred and Freddie Mac said specifically, we want to provide this third line here, support for purchase borrowers limited by income or by wealth. All right, so how do we provide more opportunity to the have nots um, in our country? All right, for lack of a better phrase, that's the best way I could put that. I just said, now this applies to refinances, rate term refis, date the rate, marry the house, right? Okay, well, you can do a rate term refi, but this prices this in, right? So this is a big waving flag that rates are going to go down. And when rates do go down, Fannie Mae is going to get their pound of flesh with these loan level price adjustments, right? Think about it. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I've got a, I've got a 5%, I'm going to do 5% down. I'm going to do 5% down right now or 3% down. Then I'm going to refi out of this in um, 12 months or 18 months, right? My home's going to appreciate in value. Now I'm, you know, I'm going to have cheaper MI. I'm going to be in this category where now I have, you know, between five and 10% equity. Well, you know, Fannie Mae is preparing for that refinance. So this is a big indication that rates are going to go down because you look at where this hits and this hits right in the sweet spot of refinances for people that buy now and refi in the next 12 to 24 months. I also think there's a credit aspect of this. Um, FICO has had a stranglehold on how lenders determine credit score for a long time. Vantage score has started to come into play. Vantage score goes to 1,000. The credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, they all go to 820 or 840 or 850. So whenever you have Credit Karma, you know, somebody says, I've got a 650 credit score on Credit Karma, they probably got a FICO score of 600, right? Credit Karma is artificially inflated, goes to 1,000. Once we start using Vantage score, that's going to increase everybody's credit score, right? So Fannie Mae is preparing for that as such. Any questions about the why before we get into some loopholes that we can use to get around this a little bit? All right, cool. Hey, Colin. Maybe not a, can you hear me okay? Yep. Maybe not a, a why per se, but like, is this something that you see changing in time, being tweaked throughout? Yeah. I mean, if you see what happened with um, the 40% debt to income threshold, they tried it and then there was such backlash in the industry, they dumped it. Um, I think that this is a conversation about politics, right? Uh, the administration now wants to encourage um, first-time home ownership. You know, they want people that are, um, you know, not inheriting houses to be able to have equal opportunity, right? They want to 
push for minority home ownership is a big goal of the administration. So um, I think that the presidential administration and that cabinet um, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac report to uh, would be the only thing that would change this in the next 24 months. Now they might tweak it, they might you know scale back some different things, but by and large, um, I think you're going to see these stay in effect for some time. All right, let's talk about a couple of loopholes. Um, so these loan level price adjustments do not apply to what's called affordable mortgage products. You guys probably know these as home ready, home possible, borrow smart. They're often your 3% down conventional loans. But did you know that they're not just 3% down? You could do a home ready loan on a 25% down mortgage if you wanted to, okay? Um, why would you wanna do that? Well. Maybe you're in this category that I talked about. I got a 720 credit score and I'm putting 20% down and it's actually penalizing me, right? Well, if you use an affordable product, then all of this is blank white. None of these loan level price adjustments in this madness applies to you if you use Home Ready, Home Possible, Borrow Smart. All right, what do I need to get into an affordable mortgage product? Great question. I'm going to give you a number that is going to become the most important number, in my opinion, for the next 12 to 24 months. And that is the AMI, which is 94,240 in much of the metro. This is all public information. You can go to Freddie Mac, you just plug in Freddie Mac income lookup. You've heard me talk about this on Tuesday and Wednesday meetings for a long time now. If you have qualifying income that's less than $94,240, you are now in an affordable product that is going to wipe away all of these loan level price adjustments. Okay. Well, wait a minute, Colin. I make a base salary of 90, but I get bonuses and I get commission and everything like that. Do you qualify just on the 90? Yeah, you do. Okay. Forget about the bonuses. Forget about the commission. Wipe those out. We're just going to qualify you on the base. And now you're in an affordable product, right? Let me give you an example of this. Um, Sarah Church. Sarah Church is on this call. So uh, Sarah, this, this one might sound familiar to you. Um, you've got a married couple. That's making $90,000 each, 5% down, 740 FICO, okay? Now, under the new guidelines, they would be charged three-eighths of a point in loan-level price adjustment. So a $300,000 loan, that's over 1000 bucks or a quarter point higher in rate. But if you just use one of their incomes for qualifying and you factor in their debt and everything like that, um, then we have just put them into a more affordable mortgage because that one income is below 80% of the AMI. It's under 94 grand, okay? So this is a loophole to make all of these loan level price adjustments go away. Now, if you have two married people, okay, well, do you have to count the married person's debt? Yeah, but you can qualify with that. Or maybe you just do the loan in one person's name and you can get access to a more affordable mortgage. Maybe that means that, you know, if you're dating or if you're engaged or if you're married, you're not going to co-sign on each other's vehicle loans because then we got to count that against both of you, right? All right, maybe you're going to have less joint debt because you want to be more strategic as a first or second time buyer and you want to be able to qualify just on one of your incomes. It also means that really experienced strategic mortgage brokers are going to say, how do we put this puzzle together? How do we get you under $94,000? Because we want you to get access to the best possible rate. Okay. 
We've been using this strategy for years on condos. Remember, loan level price adjustments don't just apply to debt to income and to credit score. They apply to the type of property that have been financed as well. So condos have a risk factor that's built in, right? So if I can qualify you on your $80,000 base salary and you make 200 grand in commissions, I'm gonna mark zero in commissions and I'm gonna take away that risk factor. So these affordable mortgages are going to be key, especially in the already tough rate environment that we're talking about here. Questions on this loophole? FHA is back. This is an old meme that circulated in uh, mortgage circles back in February. But, you know, I've talked about how FHA deals are going to come back in a big way because now we don't have to deal with all this craziness, right? It's one blanket. So maybe we got a 690 or a 700 credit score. All right. Well, hey, FHA just reduced their PMI. It's a cheaper rate. We don't have to deal with all this madness. Let's just go FHA. Right, especially if we make more than that income limit of ninety-four thousand, FHA is the way to go. So where six hundred and eighty has been that most important number in lending because everything below six hundred and eighty went FHA and everything above six hundred and eighty went conventional. Now that ninety-four thousand and change is going to be a key number. All right, FHA is also valuable because it's easier to do a streamlined refinance. Right, you don't need an appraisal. You can get these closed real quickly. Um, you know, you don't need to worry about price depreciation. It's just an FHA streamline and you're going to lower the rate versus conventional. You got to figure out what the price is of the house now and all those different things. So FHA offers are starting to come back in a big way, even on higher price point homes, 400, 450, 500, all the way up to the county max, which is uh, in the 13 counties in Minnesota, 515,200. Anybody see FHA more often lately, or am I just dreaming? I'm still seeing pretty even split. All right. We'll keep our keep our eye on that. If anything, I would say from a listing agent perspective, um, you know, it's not like, oh, can we absolutely go conventional all the time, right? You know, FHA has opened up some more doors. Uh, here's a comparison uh, that I put together, FHA versus conventional. Well, the PMI at a 700 credit score is about the same. The rate is about a point cheaper. FHA is going to get you for half a percent down more. But if you look at that monthly payment difference on a $400,000 house, minimum down, 265 bucks a month, right? That's a big difference when you're talking about the monthly outlay for somebody's budget. And that's all I have. Um, I hope this gave you a, an overview of, of what's been going on. I uh, tried to stay out of the back and forth um, political, he said, she said sort of stuff. But anybody, do you have any questions about uh, this entire thing? I'm driving. Can you hear me okay, Colin? I can. Okay. So one of the questions I keep getting is like, is this a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac change? Or is this like a political governmental change? Like who, how do you answer that without getting like to, I know you just said you tried to avoid that, but like I've gotten asked that like three times. Like, was this something that was political or was this just an effort to make homeownership more affordable for first time buyers that doesn't have anything to do with that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, they're one and the same. Right. I mean, I remember a buyer coming to me and saying, I want a loan that has nothing to do with the government. I said, great, you can pay cash. I mean, the government's so involved in lending, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are called the GSEs, the government sponsored entities. Right. Yeah. 
So they report to the president. Okay. I've just had a couple buyers come to me and be like, Biden did this, Biden did this. And like, I don't know how to respond to that in like an, I guess what's the best way to reply to that in like an educated way that's not leaning one way or the other. I mean, I would say, hey, you know what? Um, by and large, you know, the cost of getting a mortgage went down for everybody. And then I would say, you just need to be a little more strategic about how you're going to get pre-approved, right? So you can actually, yeah. you know, obviously someone who's coming to you isn't a big fan of Joe Biden, right? Say, so, hey, you know, Correct. you can actually get around this. Oh, really? Yeah. There's actually a strategic way. There's a loophole that you can use where you don't have to play by Biden's rules. <laughs> I mean, that sounds a little ridiculous, but you know what I mean? Like um, I would, yeah. I would use that loophole thing. And that, that's a, that's a, you know, way to engage somebody where they're like, wow, how do I do that? Well, actually you just, you know, you qualify with a, a certain amount and you know, if, if you make less than $94,000 in qualifying income and you can exclude your bonuses and everything like that, you can, you can make this work. And then, I mean, at least that's they're a, they're excited about sticking it to the president, as dumb as that sounds, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. But that's assuming that they want to buy a house that's below their means. I mean, if somebody's like, how expensive of a house can I buy? I mean, you got to use all the income that you can to qualify them, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. And then I was my understanding that if it was a married couple, the debts were, even if it was like, one person's name was on one loan and one person's name was on a different loan. If they were married, they were combined. Are you saying that's not the case? And if you wanted to use like, for example, the example that you gave where both couples are married, making 90,000, if they were wanted to buy a property and they could qualify off of one $90,000 income and not even use the other person, I did not realize you could do that. Correct. Now you, you'd have to qualify with the other person's debts because some people are like, Oh, we're married. I want okay. to be on the, I want to be on the loan too. No problem. You guys you, qualify with both of your debts or it's, Hey, you know, you guys can both be on the loan or I can just do the loan in Zach's name. And, you know, uh, that way you can get a cheaper interest rate. Okay. Right? So just to make sure I'm understanding this, as long as their debts are low enough to where they can qualify off of one income, they both, they can you two married couples can use or a married couple can use one income, but if the debts are too high and they need to add that other person's income to keep the DTI low enough, then that wouldn't work. Yeah, I'm probably doing a poor job explaining this. Um, so I'm I'm married and my wife and I both make $90,000 each. And I say, I wanna go buy a house and we're just gonna use my wife's income. I'm gonna use zero for my income, but we both wanna be on the loan as long as you know, if you're both on the loan, all debts have to be considered, right? Maybe the yeah. loan originator comes back to me and says, hey, if we're only using one of your incomes, then we have to count, you know, the debts of everyone who's on the loan. Yeah. Okay. And you're yep. over the debt to income ratio. So, you know, Colin, would you be okay if we just did it in your wife's name? You're going to be on title to the house. You got marital interest and everything like that. But that way you can use this because Colin, we kick you off the loan. We don't have to consider your debts. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. It does. Thank you. Question. Mm -hmm. Um. Say. So say you only use, like, say you have a married couple, or I guess how am I trying to work this? Could you say you didn't want somebody on title for a better interest rate? Could you quit claim deed them onto the? title afterwards if you're yes is the short answer uh if you're on the mortgage you must be on title if you're on title you don't have to be on the mortgage okay so let's use that same example now my wife and our buy in our house and we're just doing the financing in her name and i say well i want to be on the title Okay, great. You're on the purchase agreement. You're going to take title. You're just not going to sign any loan docs at closing. Now, um, if 
you know, if we're, if for some reason I'm not on the PA and I'm not on title and my wife closes and everything like that, it's like, Hey, Colin, you should get on title because I don't want to have to go through probate. Then yes, you could quit claim someone onto title after the loan has closed. It's going to be 46 bucks through title. Does that make sense, Jackson? Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to think of that as like another loophole to, you know, getting a better interest rate for somebody and then not having using, you know, their significant other's debt or they didn't need to use their income is to just quit claim deed them after the fact. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm just, just trying put to put them on the PA. Good. Yeah. Now, now, um, unless you're in Wisconsin and you're using a government loan, whole nother ball of wax. But, you know, if, if you've got two people that want to be on the purchase agreement, you're just doing a loan in one name. That's cool. Gotcha. That makes sense. Smart thinking, though. I mean, you're, you're thinking the right thing. Ashley, I saw a lender saying on social, it wasn't Biden. It was the FHFA that made the changes. Is that accurate? Oh, boy. Um, yeah. That was yeah. literally why I asked that question. That was where that question came from. Cause I saw that video too. And I was like, I you forgot to say that I said that it might be subjective calling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that's where that came from. I saw that same video, Ashley. I mean, Sandra Thompson runs FHFA. And by the way, we're in an industry here. That's so dumb that we thought about, Hey, after 2008, we're like, why don't we, you know, we got a name, we got to create a name for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? Which is for conventional loans. And we have FHA loans that are all government. Well, let's call it something as similar as possible. Let's call it FHFA. Like how dumb is that, right? But Federal Housing Finance Agency controls Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Sandra Thompson's a director of FHFA. She reports the president, right? So I mean, it wasn't Biden. It was the FHFA that made the changes. FHFA works for the president. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, good question. But both of you, funny you saw the same video. Anybody else have questions about this? All right. Well, I appreciate you all being here. Um, I know it's a little Thanks bit so of a much, complex Colin. subject, but I hope this helped. This was great. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, this was really insightful. Thank you for taking the time to do this. You bet, guys. Appreciate your time on, on a busy Wednesday. If there's anything we can do to help clarify, feel free to reach out.